Hi there, my name is David Petrie and I'm honoured to be part of this latest series of EFL Talks. My thanks to the EFL Talks community and to Rob Howard for inviting me along. Uh, today the topic I've been asked to talk to you about is assessment and there's quite a lot to pack into quite a short time, so let's begin. Um, when you think of assessment, you probably think of sitting down with a big test paper in front of you, trying to answer all of the questions you can in an hour or so, but this isn't really assessment, that's a test. Now, assessment is the larger category to which the smaller group of techniques and procedures belong. So, some of these, but by no means all of them, might be these big tests and exams you do at the end of the semester, or you might look at students' written work to see whether they understand the material or an are using the language appropriately. And there's also, of course, teachers' observation of the students in the lessons, noticing whether they're coping with the material or whether they are struggling to keep pace. Now, of course, this latter thing is an aspect of uh, informal assessment, which is what you end up doing every day without thinking about it. It's the constant and perpetual process of watching, checking, making judgments about how and where the learner can improve. For example, if you see a student saying orange instead of orange, and you correct that pronunciation, then you're evaluating their performance and providing feedback and correction. Formal assessment is, by turns, more periodic and intermittent, uh, often occurring at the end of a course or part of a course. Um, it is often specific to a set of language items or skills, and it is designed to encourage learners to prove their mastery over these items or skills. They are usually marked, if you think in terms of percentage scores or grades, uh, and they often have wider implications for the students, acting as a barrier to the next year group or the level of classes. Now, <clears throat> these distinctions are quite arbitrary and slightly generalised. Obviously, it's, it's perfectly possible for informal assessment to be specific, designed and periodic, just as it is for uh, formal assessment to be continual, involve feedback and correction. So perhaps... Uh, it is a better way to think of the differences in terms of the purpose of the assessment. Is it formative or summative? Now, formative assessment looks at what the students are doing while they are learning, while they are forming their knowledge and skills. Any kind of formative assessment is not really interested in the result except in what it tells us about the process. It tells us more about what the students understand rather than about what they can remember. So summative assessment then looks back at everything that's been covered, or a relevant and reflective selection of it, and attempts to summarise what has been learned. It could be used for future reference and course direction, but usually it isn't, and it tends to act as an artefact stating what the learner can recall about the course materials. Uh, from a practical point of view, formative assessment tends to be informal, and summative assessment tends to be formal. One of the other distinctions you'll also meet is norm and criterion referenced. A norm reference test is when the scores are run through a statistical algorithm in order to compare them against each other. Now, the advantage of doing this is that it can combat elements of unfairness in tests that were too difficult or where the learners all performed very poorly. Conversely, it can provide a more realistic picture when tests are too easy and all of the learners perform really well. The downside is that it doesn't really tell you about what the learners did or about their mastery of the material. It simply ranks the learners against each other in terms of performance. Uh, criterion reference tests, which are much more common in English language teaching, are where you basically predetermine what a score means. In other words, you pre-allocate a grade boundary to a test score. 80% is an A. Um, <clears throat> and then you see what the students get. Now, the disadvantage to this is that scores and grades are much more subject to the volatility of good and bad tests or assessment procedures or the subjective marking of written work. Um, the advantage is that scores are related to specific learning objectives, to learner achievement and to mastery of the material. Uh, which brings us to the difference between knowledge and ability. So, most tests uh, test knowledge. Uh, the teacher spends a few weeks working on the present simple and the test has a task that asks students to create negative sentences and questions in the present simple. Now, this tells everyone whether the student can remember and manipulate this particular discrete language point effectively. Similar approaches exist with skills work, for example listening for detailed information, and some tasks are integrated, asking learners to use both their skills and knowledge to complete the task. <clears throat> 
Um, some tests, however, particularly in the light of communicative language teaching, try to assess a student's ability to perform a different, uh, a specific task. Now, a reading test, for example, might give you three personal profiles, four different gift options, and ask you to choose the best options, the best gifts for each person. A writing test might ask you to convince your best friend to come and visit you next month. Now, these are also integrative in the sense that they combine skills and not uh, language knowledge, um, but they are focused around a task that the learner has to perform, and as such, they also assess a learner's communicative competence um, and sometimes strategic competence. So um, this brings us on to uh, traditional and alternatives. And we've already talked about some of these differences, and it's worth pointing out that the alternative approaches listed here have become more and more mainstream in recent years, as the debate on testing and assessment has built. I've worked at schools that use more traditional methods and others schools that work that uh, use more alternative methods and some that use both. And there are pros and cons in each approach and essentially the choices you make in looking at what and how to test will probably reflect more of your underlying philosophy about what language is and what learning entails than anything else. Um, there are though also stakeholder expectations to consider. Many traditional approaches persist because it's what policymakers, parents and educators experienced in their own education and therefore they see it as reflecting a certain standard. Um, there is also thinking about the purpose of high stakes exams, national exams for example, when these are used to determine entry into a university for visa purposes or for selecting candidates for employment, then standardization and more traditional approaches are likely to persist purely because it is easier to say what a test and a test score means and because it allows us to differentiate between candidates. Now, it's also worth saying that although these are presented here as dichotomous and separate choices, there is no reason why you can't combine elements of both in order to bring a more holistic approach to your assessment process. Uh, now, with grades, uh, grades dominate many young lives and can make or break your day, but what does it actually mean to get a C? Does it mean you're doing okay? Does it mean you're doing poorly? Who knows? Uh, personally speaking, I'm not a fan of letter grades because I feel they're too open to interpretation uh, and they can be subjective when they're applied to non-numerical data. It's easy enough to understand that a score of 60% on a test it means a B or a C, uh, but what does that mean when it's applied to punctuality or classroom attitude? Um, this in turn, of course, raises the issue of whether a class grade should reflect additional factors uh, such as behaviour and punctuality, or whether the grade should only be about educational and uh, educational attainment. Now, there's much to be said for the latter approach, um, but it is understandable, particularly with younger learners, that the grades be used to indicate the extent to which the learner displays desirable classroom behaviours. Now, absolute grading, which we've talked about before in terms of uh, criterion reference assessment, is where you predetermine what the grade boundaries are and you hold everyone to them. This is quite useful for institutional standardization because it means students at the same level doing the same tests but in different classes with different teachers can be assessed on the same basis and judgments can be made about their performance in terms of figuring out future educational needs. <clears throat> Relative grading though is, when, uh, is, is useful when testing is inconsistent or when the students don't need to be ranked against each other in the larger scheme of things. So a relative grade system might wait until you get all of the scores in and then allocate grade bands across quartiles or quintiles. So for example, when the whole class gets under 50% on the test, <clears throat> the top 20% might get between 50% and 40% and they would therefore all get A's under a relative grading system, but they might all get E's or D's under uh, an absolute grading system. Okay. Um, that's about it. That's all we have time for, really. There's a lot more that we could mention in this talk, but we don't have the time to do that. All of the books that are mentioned here are highly recommended if you want to look into some of these concepts further. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this EFL Talk and Assessment. My thanks again to Rob Howard and the EFL Talks team. My name again is David Petrie. Thank you for your time, and goodbye.